We are going to be doing grand rounds today, and the topic is advancing the mission of academic medicine in the COVID-19 pandemic, lessons learned from VCU and the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. My name is Michael Leroy. This is Andrew Meitinger and Kevin Switek. We're three of the uh, pulmonary critical care fellows here at VCU, and we have a special guest with us, Charles A. Powell, who we'll be introducing a little bit more shortly. We have nothing to disclose. Our objectives are to, by the end of this talk, that you guys will be familiar with the basics of COVID-19, both the clinical course and virology, specifically as this relates to current research projects at ECU. Second, you'll be familiar with the several local interventions in both clinical <coughs> care and education and how they have helped to advance the academic mission here at ECU. And finally, to understand the unique challenges faced by an academic, academic center and the epicenter of the US pandemic. We'll meet these objectives by following this outline. So first we'll introduce the topic of the COVID-19 pandemic and talk a little bit about the pathogenesis. We don't claim to be COVID-19 experts, but hopefully introduce some of the basics so we have a shared mental model, specifically as it relates to the current research interests here at VCU. We'll then talk about ways that we COVID-19 has transformed education at VCU, followed by discussing local initiatives and innovations, We'll then turn over to our expert um, in New York City and talk about innovations and experiences there. And finally, we'll have a QA and a with our panelists. So I just want to introduce all of our special guests. So I've already introduced our, uh, ourselves, the chief fellows for next year. We also have the COVID-19 research group here at VCU, Antonio Abate, Marlon DeWitt, Erin Senyal, and Mike Stevens, who will be available for question and answer at the end. And our special guest is Dr. Charles A. Powell, is a Janus and Coleman Rabin Professor of Medicine, the System Chief for the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, and the CEO of Mount Sinai National Jewish Health Respiratory Institute. He's also the Medical Director at the Mount Sinai Hospital Respiratory Care Services, uh, part of the ICANN School of Medicine <coughs> at Mount Sinai, and Professor of Medicine at National Jewish Health. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Michael. And thank you for everybody who's joining us today for what we hope uh, will be um, a very informative and interesting discussion. Uh, prior to the current COVID-19 uh, experience, this was the board game that my family used to play. Um, now that we've all been baptized by this experience, I think that we'll probably play this game differently in the future. The World Health Organization uh, approaches a pandemic by defining it as the spread of a, a worldwide spread of a new disease. While these events are rare in a generation, they are no stranger to shaping the world. Whether it's the bubonic plague, plague of the mid-1300s, uh, which caused the death of nearly 60% of the world's population, or the avian-borne flu, also known as the Spanish flu of 1918, which killed more than 50 million people worldwide. A pandemic is a powerful force of nature that will have the ability to shape the way we perform research, the way we practice medicine, the way we innovate, and the way that we educate. Let's take a brief look at how the events of the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded. December 31st, 2019, China reported its first few cases of an unknown viral illness causing pneumonia in the city of Wuhan. This was identified as a local outbreak. Almost two weeks later, China genetic, genetically sequenced the coronavirus and released information on what they had found. The sequence was approximately 82% similar to the previous severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, also known as SARS-CoV-1. A day later, the first reported case was seen outside of China in Thailand. From there, we quickly see isolated cases outside of China and the first case was reported in the US around January 21st in, 21st in Washington state. By the end of January, as cases continue to spread, the WHO and Trump administration declared public health emergencies. February was largely a time of increasing cases in China and Italy. The virus continued to spread around the globe, touching all continents except Antarctica. By the end of February, it becomes clear that there is community spread and the global risk is elevated from high to very high. March 11th, 2020, the WHO officially declares COVID-19 a pandemic and the Trump administration declares a national state of emergency. 
Social distancing starts in the United States on March 16th. From, from there, new testing strategies emerge as healthcare facilities adapt to the growing spread of disease. By the end of April, the U.S. has more than 1 million cases. Our current understanding of COVID-19 pathogenesis stems from what we know about the coronavirus in general. We know that coronaviruses as a family are a large group. They first infected humans, we think, sometime around the 1960s. By looking at the SARS-CoV-2 genetic signature, we also know that there is some amount of zoonotic transmission, likely from cat-like mammals and bats. On the right, you see a graphic taken from a review article published in JAMA earlier this month. This graphic helps to demonstrate the phases of the viral infection and where therapeutics might be able to intervene. First, the process begins with human contact with a fomite or a respiratory droplet containing the virus. Here at the top left of the image, you see the SARS-CoV-2 virus interacting with the surface of a type 2 pneumocyte uh, in the lung. The virus spike proteins make contact with the cell-derived ACE2 receptor and other co-receptors are recruited. The virus is permitted to fuse with the membrane. Once the virus is fused, the genomic payload is deposited into the cytoplasm of the cell. The positive sense RNA material is processed and replication and gene expression occur. This is shown at the bottom of the image on the right. Infected cells adapt and form tr replication transcription complexes, which are formed by host cell membranes. These RTCs are necessary for viral re replication and protect the virus from host breakdown. Infected cells are full of these multi-membrane complexes, which provide a unique challenge to the host immune system. From there, new viruses are packaged and sent to the cell surface, which is seen on the right side of the image, which is known as exocytosis, where the virus is shed and the process is repeated. If we think about this in a context of a human that's been infected, once the infection has begun, the innate immune system is activated, which initially consists of a non-specific immune response, as shown by the, at the top of the screen by the macrophage. In a subset of patients, such as those with risk factors for poor outcome, the immune system can produce an unregulated and disorganized response. This lies somewhere on the spectrum of a sort of cytokine release syndrome. These are the patients that seem to be most ill and end up in intensive care units. Now we apply this knowledge to the infected patients. This is a graphic that uh, we took from the journal of heart and lung transplantation. On the x-axis, you see severity of disease. I'm sorry, on the y-axis, you see severity of disease. And as we move from left to right is the time course after the initial infection as it moves from a viral response to an inflammatory response. There is a um, early infection phase followed by this transition each is loosely associated with specific clinical signs and symptoms. As an example, on the left side in the bottom uh, blue box, early disease, uh, patients may have mild symptoms that may be constitutional or may be totally asymptomatic. This is marked by signs of lymphopenia and perhaps a mild coagulopathy. As time marches on, patients may develop shortness of breath and hypoxemia marked by an abnormal chest X-ray and mild metabolic derangements, which is shown in the middle column in the blue boxes. In a small subset of patients, the host inflammatory response can result in devastating ARDS and multi-organ system failure. Signs of this phase include elevated lab markers, such as IL-6, D-dimer, and ferritin, which is beyond anything that we've ever seen in these sorts of viral illnesses in the past. At the bottom, uh, there's a yellow bar, and this yellow bar is the silver lining in this phase reaction. Each of these uh, boxes in the yellow bar is an opportunity to intervene in order to allow our patients to recover from their infection. And now Michael is going to talk about some of the homegrown research into potential therapies. So like Kevin said, I'll be talking about the COVID-19 research at ECU. I won't be going into a whole lot of depth of these. Um, there's going to be a medical grant around at some point in the future that we'll 
have the researchers at ESU discuss their projects in more detail. So I'm really just going to introduce the topics. So this is our VC COVID research team. We have Antonio Abate, Arun Sanyal, Marlon DeWitt, and Mike Stevens from left to right on the screen. What I think is really great about VC's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been the way that people from different divisions have been able to put aside their own research projects and been able to take that clinical uh, and uh, that clinical research experience to rapidly start projects at VCU to research COVID-19. And for any of us that have been through the IRB, we know it's been a great feat that they've been able to get projects up and going so rapidly. Just briefly going over the projects that we do have here. So the first one is a remdesivir trial. And as you can see from this schematic that Kevin introduced earlier, remdesivir acts by inhibiting uh, viral replication uh, by inhibiting this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. We also have a cerilumab trial, which is a uh, monoclonal antibody against the IL-6 receptor. And finally, we have the convalescent trial, where they take plasma from patients who have recovered from COVID-19, presumably containing antibodies, and they infuse it on patients as a therapeutic agent. So again, that's just a brief introduction, um, and th these will be discussed further in a different grant round. So I just want to talk briefly now about different ways that we've transformed education at VCU. So uh, one interesting thing that is new that we've had to deal with is that as medical, as an academic center, what you have is medical students, interns, residents, fellows, attendings, all going in to see patients which we know puts a large strain on the PPE supply for healthcare systems. So in order to mitigate that, one of the things we've had to do is to take some of the house staff off of clinical services and redeploy them in different ways. One interesting way that VCU has been able to do this is by having our interns work in the clinical command center, but this has happened in multiple departments across the institution to help make sure that we maintain the mission of educating our future clinicians um, while preserving PPE. One other way that we've been able to advance the uh, educational mission is to do teleconferencing. So we've been using Zoom for years, but of course we've been using it much more recently. So one example being, of course, what we're doing right now, which is continuing Medicine Grand Rounds. A couple other examples I thought were worth pointing out were the internal medicine program has continued to have their almost daily morning reports. And here you see an example of two chief residents facilitating morning report to a largely empty room um, with all the other participate, participants uh, logging in remotely to maintain social distancing. As I mentioned earlier, we've had to make adjustments to the uh, staffing of the institution to prevent using so much PPE. So one downside of that has been that our uh, medical students have been taken out of the clinical arena. And here's an example of an uh, innovative way that our chief residents have come up with to help continue to educate our third year residents who are on their clinical rotation through medicine. So we have Katie Wabel uh, helping a medicine resident with instructing the uh, M3, res M3 students uh, through Zoom. And then, of course, this is not just training programs that are doing this, but here's an, another example of Dr. Alan Dow, who's done an almost daily webinar series for the past month or so of the COVID bolus, where he's interviewed different people and provided this resource of CME and information to VCU health employees and also to people in the community. The next thing I want to talk about is morale building. And of course, while that's not specific to education, I think we recognize that a lot of the resilience curriculum and training that uh, we go through now and has become a part of medicine has really come out of our training programs and just wanted to highlight a couple of examples of this. So this is an example of what our own department has done. So this is a virtual happy hour that our fellows did just last week um, to make sure that we're all connecting and being able to interact with each other and let off some steam. Here's a picture from the internal medicine residency sponsored cornhole tournament um, that they've been able to do. There's also a American Idol 
same competition that they've held through Zoom. And then we've all seen, uh, for those of us that work downtown, these examples of things that the health system has been doing to help increase morale of having encouraging mes messages for our employees as they come into the healthcare system. As we think about education in the time of uh, COVID, I think one interesting perspective is thinking about our past trainees and how their experience at ECU has made them able to care for patients in this novel uh, environment. And so I just wanted to select a couple of quotes to share with you guys. So this is from Dr. Ann Lipke in Seattle, Washington. What she said was my foundations for starting and trusting a team started at ECU. And that has been critical for me in the ICU I currently direct to make it through this. I'm also a believer in the power of good critical care to get patients through storms because I've seen the VCU faculty do it a million times. A recent uh, graduate of our pulmonary program, Dr. Sarah Morgan, who's now at Ohio Health, said, I never thought I'd be facing a pandemic my first year as a pulmonary critical care attending, but my training at VCU more than prepared me to confidently step into a leadership role to manage our COVID ICU. And finally, Dr. Deb Stalnecker from St. Luke's in Pennsylvania said, my training at VCU absolutely gave me the tools and confidence to face COVID head on, living up to the nickname Ricky Bulldog that Dr. Fowler so affectionately named me. And with that, I'm gonna transition over to Andrea. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so while an academic medical center is often defined based off its research opportunities and education of house staff, we also take pride in providing outstanding clinical care for our patients, and we're faced with tackling a few challenges posed by COVID-19. A few of those that we'll address today include social distancing, safety of our healthcare workers, and shortage of PPE, hospital bed space, and testing kits. From a social distancing perspective, I think we've all seen this picture on flattening the curve. And not only is that important in our communities, but here within the hospital to try to prevent the spread of disease. We rapidly discontinued all non-essential medical appointments while contacting patients to ensure that they had no pressing needs and refilled their medications to get them through the time of this pandemic. And like other institutions, telehealth was a future goal that had not yet been fully realized at VCU. Nothing like a pandemic with mandatory social distancing to light that fire. We have seen a rapid shift into the world of telemedicine with the majority of our outpatient clinics now fully operational in the teleworld to maintain outpatient continuity. We anticipate that this will be a permanent part of outpatient care moving forward. One of the biggest concerns that was posed by this pandemic was the safety of our healthcare workers in light of significant PPE shortages. We knew that there was not going to be enough personal protective equipment, both related to the rapid increase in case counts and the virulence of this disease, but also from a decrease in our supply lines. For example, China prior to this pandemic was responsible for about 50% of the world's mass production. And when it was announced that this came out of Wuhan, their exports essentially shut down. So the challenge we were faced with is how do we make the best use out of the equipment that we already have? And in honor of our recent Earth Day celebration, I'll bring forward to you a phrase that we're all very familiar with, reduce, reuse, and recycle. So how do we reduce the use of the current PPE that we have already? These are two of our medical respiratory ICU respiratory therapists, Marquis Brusifaro and Kenesha Tarpley, and they helped me to set up what we like to call our get out initiative, in which we were trying to reduce traffic in and out of patient rooms by removing ventilator control screens and IV pumps from the room and into the hallway. As Michael mentioned, we were able to decrease the number of team members mandatory in the rooms by reallocating our house staff, but it's hard to do that from a nursing and respiratory therapy perspective for those who are at the bedside. So getting our vents and pumps out of the room was going to potentially lead to significant PPE con conservation and limit exposure of our healthcare workers to patients suspected of having COVID-19. So on a random Saturday, this is our prototype that we set up. We all got together as a proof of concept to see if we could make it work with our current equipment. Uh, you can see this is um, on the right, our ventilator screen and IV pump outside of the room in the hallway. And the ventilator remains in the room 
uh, right next to the patient where we have full control from the hall without having to enter the room. Once we realized that this was feasible, the following Friday, we had our patients, our first patient set up uh, to ensure that this was gonna work. This were, these are pictures um, that were just taken out of the medical ICU two days ago. So this is something that is fully operational. On the right hand side, again, you can see our ventilator screens in the hallway along with IV pumps delivering multiple medications to the patient through IVs that are running through the door. This was not an easy task and required the help of multiple different departments and people here at VCU, including plant operations who helped us with power supply to our IV pumps, facilities management, epidemiology, and pharmacy. Um, this is something that's really caught on and have been a success in the ICU. You can see on the top left hand, I'm sorry, right hand picture that we are, you, we have uh, these setups outside of all the negative pressure beds in the medical ICU. And the picture there on the bottom is our brain trust, sort of the initial team that set this up. As I mentioned, we were working with pharmacy to ensure safe medication delivery to our patients through long IV tubing. We worked with supply chain to order the correct length of tubes and to ensure that we would have enough supply before putting this into effect. I mentioned respiratory therapy, and of course we had input from our nursing staff to ensure we were delivering appropriate care to our patients. So how can we reuse and recycle the masks that we already have is a question that came up early on after hearing about significant PPE shortages experienced elsewhere in the world. And this is a picture of our current N95 decontamination process. We knew that there was gonna be a shortage of N95 masks and also knew that we'd be challenged to come up with a way to preserve those masks. So through a collaborative effort across many clinical and non-clinical departments, including local artists who helped to build uh, the mechanism holding up our masks, we are now using UV light to decontaminate and sterilize our used N95 masks. We currently have the ability to decontaminate up to 12,000 masks per day, which isn't anywhere close to our current use of around 1,000 per day, but we're using the extra space to decontaminate masks of our other frontline community partners. Of note, masks can be reused up to 10 times with this current method. And most importantly, before getting put back into circulation, these masks are undergoing rigorous quality check to ensure the safety of our healthcare workers. We also anticipated mass shortage of, I'm sorry, shortage of droplet and surgical masks and have received a huge outpouring of support from both private and local businesses of handmade masks, which are being widely used as you can see here. So how are we going to care, who's going to care for these patients and where are we going to put them was a big question that came up early on. There was a big concern about space, particularly because in the medical ICU, we have eight negative pressure beds, which led to a uh, rapid uh, transformation of our C3 unit, just one floor below us, into a mini medical ICU. And plant operations and facilities management helped us with that. You can see that they installed glass windows in all the doors so we could use those as ICU beds. Our operating rooms were ready to be transformed and ready to be utilized, but we were lucky enough that we had not had the volume yet to have to uh, move into that space. And from a non-ICU bed standpoint, two of our hospital wards were rapidly transformed all into negative pressure beds, again, with the help of plant operations and facilities. From a personnel standpoint, there was a big concern early on that the medical respiratory ICU team would not be able to care for all these patients, and we have had an outpouring of support from other ICUs leading to multidisciplinary surge planning with other ICU directors and other ICU teams have really stepped up to help offload the Mariki service right now. Additionally, we've had a procedure team staffed by non Mariki providers available for procedures and lines when we are not able to do so. Lastly, testing shortages we knew early on were going to be an issue, mostly related to lack of reagents to run the test. Thankfully, we have Dr. Christopher Dorn, who's the director of microbiology at VCU, who took on this challenge and developed a rapid test over the course of about 10 days. We now are able to get results back on COVID patients in eight to 12 hours, as opposed to the initial three to five day window. 
Dr. Doran has also partnered now with the Molecular Lab and they are expanding testing further, providing testing for facilities out in the community here in Richmond. I'll end the innovation section with a quote from one of our Mercury clinical coordinators and charge nurses, Pam Falls, who said, no day is the same, information is changing rapidly and I cannot focus on what happened yesterday. I have to keep moving forward during this time. Our unit looks nothing like it did a month ago. In summary, we've touched briefly on COVID-19 pandemic and the basics about the disease itself, the research and medical education transformation that had to take place in light of the pandemic and the clinical innovations that we put in place to continue taking excellent care of our patients. And now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about experiences from New York with our special guest, Dr. Charles Powell. Dr. Powell, thanks for joining us today. Can you hear us? I can. Thank you for sharing your experience. Very interesting. Great. Well, again, thanks for being here. We have a few questions that we've prepared uh, to hear about your experience up in New York. So before first, you do your questions, I, I want to level set a little bit and okay. share with you our experience. Great. And then, um, and then I'm happy to take your questions. So I'll, I'll share my screen for a moment if that's okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 So this is a situation in New York as of April 26th. 157,000 cases, 40,000 patients hospitalized, and about 17,000 deaths in New York City alone. Mount Sinai Health System, just again to um, know what we're talking about here, we're eight hospitals in the boroughs of Manhattan and in Long Island. We see 4 million patients a year. We have 42,000 employees and all of our full-time faculty are part of the medical school, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. We're the, the largest academic medical center network in New York City. You put up your timeline and here's ours. It's very similar to yours. Just a, a couple of relevant time points with regards to Mount Sinai. Like you, we began preparing in January early January after the initial cases were identified in China. Uh, our schools were closed on March 16th. It was too late. Uh, before the schools were closed, we had the first cases identified in Westchester, New York, it's close by, and then in New York City itself. Our first admission to Mount Sinai was March 7, and that was the beginning of us entering our peak. Uh, we starting in January, made preparations to ensure that we had enough PPE, we had enough ventilators and enough beds and enough staff to care for all the patients. And, and we had enough of everything to take care of everybody and we still do. How'd we do it? Well, we increased our ICU capacity significantly. At our peak, we had 2,000 patients in our healthcare system with COVID. Every hospital was all COVID all the time. In Mount Sinai Hospital itself, we start off, we have 98 critical care beds. We increased to 240. We filled them all. How did we make 240 negative pressure rooms? This is the front of our hospital pretty much blew out the windows in these rooms, put up a wooden board, and inside the room is a HEPA filter to, that converted each of these rooms into negative pressure. Almost all of our ICU rooms became double occupancy. That was the other thing that we did. And of course, all the pumps were outside the room uh, for, for all these patients as well. We put beds everywhere. This is Central Park. Normally, it's people playing softball, but here, these are tents, and these tents are full of patients. This, the tents are staffed by a charitable organization called Samaritan's Purse, where they were able to care for 100 patients, 10 ICU patients. So one of these tents had 10 stretchers with ventilators to care for critically ill patients. This is our lobby. It's now 
full of patient rooms to be able to handle the overflow. So we had to scale up our hospital system from 2,500 beds to be able to accommodate 4,200 beds. So each hospital had to increase by 50% the number of beds available. And these are some of the ways we did that. And then just to show you where we ended up. So this is this black line is the line of projected admissions to our hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital over time. It's based upon the prevalence of disease, length of stay in a hospital, and impact of social distancing. And uh, at our peak, we had about 2,100 patients in, in our health system. And now we've gone down to um, a little over 1,000. So this is our experience in terms of numbers, in terms of some aspects of our preparation. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have and may go back to some slides if they'll be relevant. Great, thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, so as, as your slides definitely show, New York City has been hit harder than basically anywhere else in the United States. What has it been like to be in the center of that storm for you, so to speak, and what have been your most challenging moments? It's terrible. COVID is terrible. There's no other way to put it. The, um, the aspects of dealing with the pandemic have changed over time. If we were doing this ooh, three weeks ago, it would be a different conversation. Because at that point in time, the, the main concern we had was whether we would be able to provide care for everybody who needed it. Not only in our health system, but everywhere in New York City. So I just showed you the projected number of hospital admissions. I showed you that model for the health system. And we do that model every day. And we started doing that model in the beginning of March. And when we first started doing the model, and I told you it's based upon infections in the community, it's based upon R naught or the spread of infection and the impact of social distancing, it's based upon market share, we're 17%, and it's the initial projection was that we would have 22,000 patients hospitalized at Mount Sinai. That was a projection at the beginning of this. That's a big problem. I, I mentioned our capacity was uh, 4,500 at max. So that, so the, there was, the concern was we wouldn't be able to meet the demand. Um, but nevertheless, we created all those beds. Nevertheless, we bought 900 ventilators. Nevertheless, we created solutions to turn home ventilators into ventilators that could be used in the critical care setting. We brought in staff from everywhere. Certainly, we brought in staff from using doctors who had nothing else to do because the ambulatory sites were closed and, and the surgery was postponed. So we had a lot of doctors who had the ability and, and certainly the wherewithal to help. We brought them in. But we also hired doctors from all over the country, locum tenums, et cetera, and brought them into the system. We brought in nurses, we brought in respiratory therapists, we brought, we brought in a lot of people to, to help us. And, but every day we weren't sure where the peak was going to be. But every day we saw once social distancing put into effect, the peak number of patients anticipated being in the hospital would decrease by one to 2,000 every day. And so that was the hope that that would continue and get us to a point where we could manage the pandemic in terms of having the resources. And, we, and that happened. That was nothing we did at Mount Sinai. That is a public health intervention and the impact of a public health intervention. And that had the biggest impact on outcomes due to this pandemic than anything or any medicine that we're going to ever talk about is the impact of social distancing. So we got past that point and then we got to our peak. And so then the, then the, the, then it shifts, right? The, the focus shifts a little bit from being a, preparing to care for all these patients to actually caring for the patients in front of us. And that's a challenge we're much more comfortable in dealing with. That's what we're trained to do and that's what we do very well. And then that's terrible too, because this disease is horrible. It, it's, it's, um, most people do fine. 
80 to 90% of people who get COVID are fine. They don't need to come to the hospital and, and they, they, take, they take care of themselves at home and they're, they're okay. 20% need to come to the hospital. Most of those patients are gonna be fine too. We've discharged over 3,000 patients already from our health system. But 25% of patients are gonna require critical care and those patients are quite sick. And, and we don't understand the disease at the pathophysiology level nearly as well as I think we hoped we would when this started. And, and so we see many of our critically ill patients not getting better. Uh, we see a lot of our critically ill patients stable for a period of time and then dropping off the face of a cliff really fast. We see a lot of the patients who are in the hospital, not in the ICU, who are not well enough to go home, stick around long enough to deteriorate and get sick too. And, and so that, that um, aspect of being confronted with a disease for which we're not uh, comfortable with the pathophysiology, for which we don't have a, a, a reliable treatment, that's a terrible place to be too. So it's, it's terrible. Yeah. yeah, that's it. We've had similar experiences here. Um, and great transition to our next question, which is kind of thinking, so it's totally different hearing case reports from China, hearing case reports from Italy to actually caring for these patients. And I think that our, our thoughts about how to care for these patients has really changed over the course of the past couple of months. Um, what, is, what are some examples of ways that you've noticed that our care has changed or that our thoughts about the clinical presentation and clinical course have changed? So we tried hard to prepare for this, like you did. Um, one of the interventions that we did is we held a teleconference with several of the physicians who went to Wuhan to care for patients in China. I have, I have uh, academic appointments at five hospitals in, in China, including the West China Hospital, which sent four physicians to Wuhan. They were amongst the 40,000 doctors who went there. So we did a teleconference with them towards the end of their stay to learn as much as we could from their experience. And that was, that was useful and insightful for us. It really helped us to be prepared for understanding that this is not ARDS as we are used to thinking about ARDS. It, typically in ARDS, the lungs are stiff and there's complete whiteout. Here, the lungs are pretty darn compliant and the process is much more heterogeneous. The, the, um, other aspect was, this is not simple cytokine storm. And that was one of the other scenarios that was um, being um, put forward. Certainly there's an exuberant inflammatory response that we see in individuals, but it's not the same kind of cytokine storm that we see in CAR-T, for example. And, and so approaches that we think may work in CAR-T are not necessarily gonna work in, in this setting as well. In, in COVID, like in everything else, we learn a lot on the fly by necessity because the patients are here, they're in front of us, they're dynamic, and there's not time to go through the typical academic pace on making a discovery and, and proposing a, a study to evaluate it and waiting for all the requisite approvals. Everything's speeded up. Everything's done appropriately and in a controlled fashion, but everything is speeded up. So one of the early observations that we made and others made was the importance of the coagulation system here. You know, some, some of the observations were pretty innocuous that all the lines would clot off much more frequently than we would otherwise see. And then some of our early autopsies showed PE, so looking at macro clot. But the phys some of the physiology we saw wasn't really PE physiology, it was much more of a, a small vessel physiology a small vessel occlusion physiology, in addition to noticing that there was a, a general endothelial dysfunction contributing to the pathophysiology, whereby you have small vessel thrombosis accompanied by endothelial dilatation that can account for the dead space that we would frequently see in patients and the compliant lungs we could see in patients. And in fact, we had a series of patients who were critically ill and dying. And to address the small vessel thrombosis, those patients were treated with lytics, thinking that they may also have uh, massive PE. 
And what we were able to demonstrate in, the, in those patients was that there was a rapid change in their dead space, suggesting that there was a component of endothelial obstruction that was contributing to the dead space and helped to really emphasize the importance of both small vessel and large vessel thrombosis. We moved quite quickly to institute a widespread anticoagulation scheme for managing our patients, ranging from prophylaxis in everybody who could tolerate it, to stratifying individuals in terms of risk for clot, and then using an intermediate dose anticoagulation scheme for those at risk for clot who are not in the ICU, and a full dose anticoagulation scheme for those who tolerate it in the ICU setting. And there will be a publication in Jack if it's not already out, showing the before and after in terms of outcomes in patients um, with those before the anticoagulation regimen was instituted versus those afterwards in, in terms of the research that's been done. So it's not typical ARDS. It's not typical cytokine storm. There is involvement of the coagulation cascade. These are some of the learnings we made on the fly and some of the things we did in response. Um, so here we are, April 30th. Um, the story continues to evolve. Your cases are coming down. Our cases are stable. Some states are even starting to open up or relax some of the, the social distancing um, recommendations. What, looking at this from where you are, from where we are, what piece of advice do you give to those frontline healthcare workers today? Well, yeah, so there are a couple of things in there. So, so if we're talking to the frontline healthcare workers, the most in, important things are to make sure that they are protecting themselves. So we are, I told you we brought in a lot of workers from all over the country who did a lot of different things and we put them in position to provide care in a way that they weren't necessarily accustomed to, but nobody was put in front of a patient until they were provided with the requisite equipment and trained in how to use it. So that's, that's the most important thing. And then the other two important things are, one is to put your head down and take care of what's in front of you, and that's the sick patient. And then the other thing is to try and learn from the experience because the, these patients are, have a disease that we don't completely understand and there are lessons to be learned. A lot of what I told you about in terms of what has been done to change our approach has emanated from experiences at the bedside. So at smart people at the bedside, being able to translate observations into meaningful hypotheses that can be tested and then moving that forward. So really those are the elements that I think are crucial. Protection, getting the work done that needs to get done for the patient in front of you and learning from that experience so that we can do better for the next patient. We uh, really appreciate those insights. I think at this point, we'd like to bring in the rest of the panelists. Sure. And we have uh, quite a few questions that we'd like to pose to the group. And so give us about a, a moment to get the panelists on board. So, um, Again, this is for you, Dr. Pog. This is sort of Q&A from the audience now for you and our other panelists. So, so one question here, there are lots of theories why New York has been hit so hard by COVID, physical proximity, mass transit, pollution, underlying chronic disease, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? So, all right, well, I'm, I was born in New York. I'm a New Yorker and many New Yorkers think that we are the center of the world. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're a capital for international business. We're, we are a, a capital of commerce and entertainment. We have more international visitors than anywhere else. It, I think it's as simple as that. It's just where the planes landed and who was on those planes. Also, our population density is quite high. And and so that's the other reason. So you have the infected individuals coming to this area and you have high population density and that's all it takes to have rapid spread of infection like this. It, it's, 
that's I think that's it's as simple as that. Another question we had was um, for you, Dr. Powell, was uh, you kind of mentioned earlier some of the trials that you guys are doing there, and we've talked about the trials we're doing here. Can you speak a little bit more to what other trials you guys are there using, doing there, and what else you guys are using outside of trials that you think is or is not working? Um, so we, we've created a very large research infrastructure at Mount Sinai that involves probably 200 investigators right now in our, in our school and around the, the health system. So concomitantly, these efforts are taking place in pathology. We've done 60 autopsies right now on patients who've expired from COVID. And, and there are multiple different levels of studies going on to investigate those tissues, including electron micro microscopy. Uh, we have developed testing. We are one of the four FDA approved antibody tests. We are unique in that our test is not only qualitative, in terms of presence or absence of antibody, but it's quantitative. So it provides a titer. That titer is used to identify patients who can donate convalescent plasma. We use a cutoff of one to 320. And then those patients donate convalescent plasma. We are the largest recruiter of patients to the convalescent plasma study in, in the US right now. Uh, our immune monitoring core in conjunction with us has established a very large biorepository all patients who have COVID in our health system, and you saw there a lot, are enrolled in this registry that in, acquires blood specimens and other biospecimens from patients that are being stored and processed for understanding the immune environment and the uh, serological and cytokine alterations that can occur in these patients. Um, we are one of the centers of understanding flu. We have Peter Polisi and Adolfo Gastro Sastre here. And so they have basic science procedures undergoing right now to understand how this virus does what it does and, and what may impact it. At the same time, we have a large clinical trials infrastructure. And that's what I'm showing you here on the left. We've established an uh, oversight group of seven experts at Mount Sinai and key stakeholders. And we have 10 subcommittees comprised of experts in all the different areas that can be studied in the COVID pandemic. That can be focused on vaccine development, on prophylaxis, on monitoring patients, devices, all the way through antivirals and, um, and, and other approaches. And, and any potential agent or any potential device that is proposed for study goes through a process that gets reviewed by the expert panel and their recommendations come up to the oversight committee that I participate on. And then those that make it through that pathway then are put into clinical trials. This on the, on the screen shows you um, last week's regimen of therapeutics that we use for our patients here in the hospital and also the clinical trials that are open. So we, we use hydroxychloroquine for patients who have normal heart rhythm if they're admitted to the hospital. We understand and appreciate the evidence base isn't particularly strong, and we may revise it as we get more data about hydroxychloroquine, but right now that is used relatively routinely. Uh, anticoagulation I told you about. We've been participating in multiple trials in remdesivir, both in the moderate setting and in the severe setting and that continues. I told you about convalescent plasma. We have trials using mesenchymal stem cells. They're provided to us by a company that, uh, that produces allogeneic mesenchymal stem cells. We use that in a severe setting with some signal that it may provide some benefit and as leading to now a randomized control trial. We just opened up this week GMCSF as a therapeutic trial, and next week we'll be introducing eculizumab, a complement inhibitor, which I, I think shows some potential pathophysiological role here in mediating some of the endothelial dysfunction that is important in this disease. I'm the PI for that. It's an expanded access protocol and the RCT. So that's our menu of clinical trials and research in COVID.
We've been getting uh, a few questions here about uh, the use of social media. Um, Dr. Powell, this is for you and as well as the other uh, research panelists. We, I think, have all been trying to work through living in a, um, in a current situation where social media, we're using it, we're using Twitter and Facebook to share ideas, share concepts uh, as well. Um, things are coming out in journals and are published perhaps even the, the, the day that they're um, submitted. How do you all see, um, how are we to interpret that data? How are we to digest it and then apply it to patients? What would you recommend as leaders in healthcare systems? Uh, yeah, I'll start off. I'm interested in everybody else's opinion. So I think there, there are a couple different lenses to view all the information through. So one lens is as a clinician. So as a, as a clinician, I think we have to rely upon evidence that is reviewed and vetted. And we typically refer to the CDC websites and other uh, organizations to guide us in terms of clinical application. Um, we've all been confronted with examples where there's a report showing that the ACE2 receptor is important in this disease. And you showed it too, it is. And so I had some of my clinicians telling me, well, we're gonna change our blood pressure medicines for our patients based upon this. There, there, there was no evidence to suggest doing that would be of any help whatsoever. And so, so it really reinforced the concept that before making a clinical change, we have to rely upon sound evidence that is reviewed. And certainly once um, we had information back from AHA and, and the renal experts, then we knew that we didn't and shouldn't be changing any ACE inhibitor medications in response to the, the knowledge. So that's the clinician hat. But then as a researcher, I think we want to take all these things into mind. And, we, and, we, and perhaps you never know where a good idea is going to come from. And, and certainly, um, there's gonna be some good ideas and there gonna be some terrible ideas that come through in an unfiltered fashion. But then it's up to us to figure out what makes sense and what doesn't. And that's what scientists do all the time. So I, I think it's healthy to have all that information out there. And, uh, but we always counsel patients, you know, especially as it regards the clinical implications that what they see on social media in an unfiltered fashion may not be useful or helpful for them and we guide them to more um, uh, vetted sites where they can get reliable information, uh, other than those news conferences where <laughs> you can't get reliable information at the time. Um, we have an additional question. Actually, several people have asked this question pointed towards our own Dr. Stevens here. There are concerns now with the social distancing parameters being being lightened by the government and um, will that lead to a second surge and do we feel like this is the right time to do that? Dr. Stevens, what do you think? Um, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, yeah, so I, I won't um, take too much of our time. This could be a whole grand rounds discussing this. People talk <laughs> about the hammer and the dance. Hammer was putting in the um, very dramatic social distancing uh, that we sort of was referenced uh, in March. The dance is you go, uh, you open up a little bit, you see what the effect will be, maybe three weeks later you pull back, you open up a little bit more. Um, you have to remember something like 95% plus of the US population is still naive to the virus. That means there's a whole lot of people who uh, could become infected and all of the same things are gonna happen in terms of uh, potential surges. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there in the interest of time. If I could, I'll just add on a little bit here because I, I like that your points very much. And this is really a key. This is key. So I agree with the concepts and 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 in my, my view, the only way to know whether relaxation of social distancing is working or not is to be able to test and know what the prevalence of infection is, right? And, and so I, I myself, and I'm, I'm uncomfortable in areas of the country opening up without being able to test. I kind of think of it as you, you have a, 
a wild animal in a dark room. And so mm -hmm. you open up social distancing and you, you're entering that dark room, but you don't, you can't see the animal there. And just like you don't know the virus is in the community unless you test. And so I, I really am concerned, especially in the states that had not shown a decrease in prevalence over time. So we all want to be able to get back closer to normal, appreciating that normal is going to take a long time, if ever, to get to again. But that relaxation re likely needs to be accompanied by the ability to test. And then, then we can know whether we're working. I agree in three weeks, we'll get a clue. And that clue will be in the number of people who are coming to the hospital. And so that would be one way to find out. But I think we'd all love to be able to find out earlier and be able to isolate earlier and prevent hospitalizations if possible. Um, I think at this point, we're gonna go ahead and thank everyone for their time. Uh, we know that all of your schedules are, are busy. This is an unprecedented um, experience we're all going through, but we are so happy to hear your thoughts and to have, have you here to share your experiences. So thank you to Dr. Powell, and thank you to our research panelists as well for uh, being around uh, and available. And thank you to the Department of Internal Medicine for having us and inviting us to share our thoughts and experiences with everyone. Um, from all of us, we hope you have a good rest of the day and be safe and be well. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.